Tonight on The Struggle, understanding the ununited Australia party, Smith Street Collingwood says hello world, and paying our respects to mythical monarchs. Someone important died recently. So naturally, wall-to-wall -wall media coverage across every single platform for a definite time is in order. So much for resting in peace. But one of the problems with committing to rolling coverage is that you have to keep churning out stories, even when there are none. And when there's nothing left to scrape from the bottom of the barrel, what better to do than look up to the skies and simply write what you see? In this case, shapes and clouds. A truly proud day in the history of journalism. Well, let's reluctantly cross now to the insufferable Max Payne. Today, we are celebrating a rebalancing of nature. A man is finally Queen of England. Honestly, it couldn't have happened too soon. The British Empire fell off during Liz's reign. They took L's in Sierra Leone, Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, Zambia, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Fiji, the Gambia, Guyana, Malawi, Malta, Mauritius, Pakistan, Rhodesia, Trinidad and Tobago, South Yemen, and most recently Barbados. King Charles Manson should bring all those countries back into the empire, like a man holding his abused family together. Speaking of family, what about domestically? There's room for improvement there too. As it turns out, the Queen secretly altered more than a thousand bills through a procedure called the Queen's Consent. Ugh, consent. Regardless, those are rookie numbers, Charlie boy. A real king doesn't let any democracy go unchallenged. Veto a hundred thousand bills. At least we know the monarchy is in safe, strong, male hands for years to come. And I know Charles III will do an excellent job as king. After all, he's managed to hold on to his hair even longer than his heir. So of course, we can trust him to hold the Commonwealth together. Back to you, Ren. <laughs> oh, right, well, with Collingwood knocked out of the AFL final series over the weekend, we've sent our Inner North correspondent out to gauge how the suburbs' self-esteem is tracking. Hi Ashlinators, it's me, In and North Ashley, coming to you live from the sacred corridor of Smith Street Collingwood. Well, Little Smith Street. The big one's a bit too gentrified today. It's so good to be home. <laughs> I love the 86. If you know, you know. Now, last month, Time Out announced that Smith Street was no longer the coolest street in the world. It had been replaced by some godforsaken Brew Wellington in <clears throat> Montreal, wherever the hell that is. Maybe they speak French there. Well, you know what we speak on Smith Street? Whatever the hell we want. I'm here today to show you that the media is lying. Smith Street is still the coolest street in the world. Only $9 for this coffee? Such a bargain. Met the love of my life here. Don't remember his name or if it was he or Yaya's, but it was really special. We don't really have a lot of parks around here, so we mostly just sit in alleyways. <laughs> it's like really good for your posture though. <laughs> this place is so special to me. It's the first time I met a fan in real life. He turned out to be my high school maths teacher, but like, still counts. The 86 tram. Will you be my man? Or may they them? I don't judge. You flounce down Gertrude and then into the city. Take me places when I'm feeling shitty. I'm your biggest fan. 
I hope you've all learnt a thing or two about why Smith Street is still one of the coolest streets in the world. Madonna said everybody comes to Hollywood. I say wrong. Everyone comes to Collingwood. Collingwood, the centre of the universe. Anyway, let's now check in with our wildlife doyen extraordinaire, Bindi Prickle. Welcome, Bindi. Hello, Red. Oh, B Bindi, what's wrong? Are you okay, babe? I'm not okay, sadly. I'm here today to announce to your viewers the extinction of the Palmer Possum. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. How did they go extinct? Nobody cares about them. As much as we try to make them as popular as the Albo kangaroo or as infamous as the Hanson dingo, nobody cared about the lemon yellow Palmer Possum. Oh, that, that's such a shame. We tried so hard to get people to care. We held rallies. We sent out text messages. We spent a lot of money. Now, how much money did you spend? About a hundred million. A hundred million? That's a lot of money. Why, why so much? Because saving the Palmer Possum isn't just about the Palmer Possum. It's about saving Australia and the values and rights that Australians hold so dear. But what values and rights are those? Freedom, Ren. Freedom. And coal mining. Oh. But it was no use. Nobody cared. You can only do so much for an animal that refuses to be vaccinated against deadly viruses and falls over and hits its head all the time. I thought there was still at least one in the Senate. I, I mean, your zoo was? What's its name? Ralph. No, Bab. Babette. You have a possum named Babette. Nobody cares about Babette. He doesn't do anything. All he does is stand on a high horse in the back of the exhibit and bark nonsense at all the other animals. Besides, even he looks like he's only sticking around for one term in the zoo. I am so sorry, Bindi. Well, <laughs> just let you collect yourself. Thank you so much for speaking with us about the Palmer Possum during such a difficult time. Of course. And as they say down under, Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. R.I.P. <laughs> right then, we're off to a quick break. <laughs> Who is that? Guess what? It's not Craig Kelly. <laughs> it's a miracle. Welcome back. In mildly amusing news, bees belonging to Elizabeth II were informed of her death by the Buckingham Palace beekeeper, who whispered in hushed tones that their queen bee had passed away. The bees were noticeably disturbed, with one bee stating the news would break their soul, while another asked, who will run the world? And a third questioned whether the queen is now up in heaven wearing a halo. Regardless, speaking of the royals, let's head over to Karen Govech, who is a royal pain in the... This talk about the death of the Queen has got me thinking about the dying attraction that is the Royal Melbourne Show. Did you know that children under the age of 14 will receive free entry into the show this year? I mean, how ridiculous! Free access to rides should be given to those who can afford it. If you broke heathen critters want to ride a roller coaster, go work in the mine shafts. I thought this free entry PR stunt was meant to make up for the last two years of cancellations due to the pandemic. And I almost believed that to be the case until my Neighbourhood Watch investigation discovered the dark truth. In 2019, an 11-year-old girl ended up in hospital with an arm injury after riding on one of the show's many portable gravity-defying death traps, The Fury. If I wanted my kids playing with dangerous furries, furies, I would give them unrestricted access to the internet, not weekend passes to the world's most mediocre children's petting zoo. It's clear to me that free access is nothing but an experimental move to stop parents from suing the show if their children end up injured, killed, or ooh, even worse, happy. I personally love seeing children hop on these rides. After all, each kid that leaves the show in an ambulance means one more show bag for me. But that's besides the point. 
<clears throat> the behaviour of these show organisers is absolutely unacceptable and I, for one, will not tolerate it. Savage. Anyway, let's head over to Scamantha, the queen of dodgy show bags. Thanks, Ren. Feast your eyes on the greater sale in history, happening right here on The Struggle. Be prepared to take out your credit cards, afterpay passwords, or savings from lockdown payouts. Because today is the day for a royal garage sale straight from Buckingham Palace. Let's see what treasures we can salvage from this soon-to-crumble empire. First up, a corgi and a corgi dachshan mix. I'm sure they're party trained. All the swans and dolphins in Britain who miss their previous owner. This lovely limited edition travel size tapestry with the beautiful queen's face on it for only $19.26. The queen's iconic green screen outfit, priceless. And a Duke of York. We'll label this one strictly over 18s. There's no better time to say shut up and take my money. It's not every decade we get to do this, so I'd say spend like a queen. I mean king. We do not accept any queen-based payments of Australian $5 notes, the NZ $20 notes, or any coins as they may no longer have any significance or any worth. So I suggest throwing them away, burning them to heat your homes, or kindly donate them to the struggle. Back to you, Ren. Sound legit to me. Well, with the Queen's image still plastered on the Aussie $5 note, there's been plenty of chatter around who or what should be transplanted in her place. Candidate 1, the Melbourne Star. It wouldn't be the first structure on our currency, and just like cash nowadays, it's completely useless. Alternatively, Boris Johnson. A like-for-like -like replacement for Her Majesty, given he too is an elderly Brit who's just lost power. Or, for a more local flavour, Steve Irwin. Just like the Queen, he's admired, beloved and dead. Either way, let's check in on how our sports therapy patient is faring. So, last week, 19-year-old tennis player Carlos Alcaraz won the US Open, becoming the youngest player to earn the title of world number one. And quite frankly, I'm baffled. How are these children gallivanting around becoming world-famous athletes? I mean, I'm only 20 myself, but my, my most significant achievement this week was muscling up the energy to submit my assignment on time, and I even had a five-day extension. Honestly, I'd argue that writing a 2,000-word article on the failures of the monarchy is a harder feat than chasing a ball up and down a court. <laughs> Dogs can do that. Where's my millions of dollars in numerous accolades? I didn't even get a HD on that assignment. I guess tennis is a bit of a kid's game anyway, with Novak refusing to take his medicine and being shunned to the naughty corner, and Kyrgios throwing a tantrum after tantrum. And now that Serena's gone, who's gonna keep these boys in line? Ugh, you know what? I'm done with tennis. It's stupid anyway. There's no need to get angry. Shut up! You're supposed to be supporting me here! Passion. Don't you love to see it? Well, Time to get sensual with Dommy Tricks. Hello, and welcome back to my dungeon, Down Under. A lot has changed since the last time I came on your screens. Inflation has seen the stock market bottom out, which surprises me because I didn't know a fetish could do that. On the other hand, Trisha Paytas gave birth, disappointing everyone on OnlyFans with a pregnancy kink. And unfortunately, the Queen of Corgis passed on, which is a shame because doggy style is quite up my alley. And to top it all off, the British throne is now in the fingers of King Chode, I mean, King Charles III. Such a switch in power has never been seen by the most of you at least. This ropes in a new era. Charles has been waiting to get into this position his whole life. Now, he's in control, like I am in the bedroom. Speaking of things he's been waiting to get into, I think it's only fair to address the bulging issue. Tampon gate. I mean, due to the naughty actions of the voyeuristic staff at the now defunct News of the World, we discovered that baby boomers don't know how to sext. Next time, just use Snapchat. I mean, I'm not one to judge. Everyone has kinky inclinations, but fantasizing yourself as Camila's soaky, moist tampon is downright disgusting. Seriously disgusting to think that the ever so glorious British Empire is now in those puffy hands. I'm sure Lizzie is rolling in a freshly made grave. No wonder she held on for so long. Anyway, back to you, Ren. Disturbing. 
Anyway, with the Dubonnet cocktail dubbed the Queen's favourite drink, the French aperitif has been cleared off shelves by customers wanting to pay homage to the Queen. And if you too want to raise a toast to the Queen's life but can't get your hands on her tipple of choice, here's another regal flavoured drink that might just fill the void. <laughs> With 35% alcohol, this is for those taking the loss of Lizzie particularly hard. <laughs> oh, we're off to a quick break. Oh, Marg. Oh, I love you, Marg. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's check in to see what our mindset coach has in store. Hello, lovely friends. The Queen of England has died and the Western nations are grieving. Australia, the UK, New Zealand and Canada, they're all paying their respects by announcing state mornings and public holidays. Um, and India apparently. As a mark of respect to the departed dignitary, the government of India had one day of state mourning on Sunday, September 11th. I mean, in life you can either lament over the past or get on with it. So I say why not celebrate 75 years of independence and our colonizers at the same time. Never mind the British took over India. Happiness is a choice, my friends. But Indians all over social media don't seem to agree. They are questioning the decision of a national mourning for the British Queen. And they're asking what's the need, why? Well, I'm here to tell you why. Because we are not barbarians. We are a civilized nation now. We love the Queen of England because the past is history and tomorrow is a mystery, my friends. I mean, that's the way the West goes about things, at least. And if you notice, the state morning was on a Sunday, so no one was really impacted by it anyway. Friends, we all know, there's a price for everything in this world. Colonialism was just the price some paid for a 200-year-long civilizing class. And it seems they're still repaying the installments. India is keeping up diplomacy and keeping up with the geopolitical Kardashians. Back to you, Ren. Thanks, Phoebe. Well, enough waxing lyrical. Let's hear some actual lyrics thanks to our Broadway baby. Ever since I was a little girl I've wanted to grow up and own the world To have an empire I can call my own To crush my enemies and inherit the throne I'm a girl boss, a corporate queen Self-made like Kim K and Kylie I got my ass up and I worked Other girls into the ground just to earn these perks I've hustled so hard I'd outrun all the men With can-do capitalism I'll never need a friend again I reel in my followers by telling them that they slay Before I shame them for how much they currently weigh Then I sell them my herbal detox tea To share those pounds along with their dignity Hey, I've also got this futurist female tea If you buy 500 or more, I might give you one for free I now have my very own rustic French chalet Built on the millions of women I've enslaved I keep my nails manicured and freshly painted When signing NDAs for sweatshop workers who have fainted I live stream the whole thing when I help destroy the earth Show you a woman can do it in heels and a skirt I'm a girl boss, a corporate queen Black lives only matter to boost sales and make me more green I bought feminism, it's now rebranded as my face It's copyrighted so all retweets will mean a court case I'm a girl boss, a corporate queen Like Ellen DeGeneres, but somehow even more mean And if you ever dare to question me The incels will gladly point out its misogyny I'm a girl boss, a corporate queen 
Gonna be the richest white bitch you've ever seen. Bezos and Musk can suck my d I've got billions even though I'm just a chick. Iconic. Now, let's get a dose of entertainment with Bob Cheapix. There is no Easter Bunny, there is no Tooth Fairy, and there is no Queen of England. Yes, that's right, as everyone and their monarchist grandmothers have heard by now, the Queen is dead. But the show must go on. And go on it did, literally, with viewership of the Netflix's The Crown skyrocketing by about four times since the Queen's passing. But with talks of season six being delayed, how will we ever get our dose of royal drama? I say, who needs a TV show when you can watch the drama that is the actual royal family unfold in real time? Just ask these people, who camped out to score front row seats to the greatest show on at the moment, The Queen's Funeral. All the characters that you know and love are there. The dutiful daughter Anne, everyone's favorite and the best option to succeed for the Queen. Except for the fact that she was born second. The very hands-on Prince Andrew. Someone should tell him that that young woman he's groping is actually one of his daughters. The plot thickens with the return of the black sheep of the family, Harry and Meghan. The two put on a brave face for the cameras as they walked alongside their new heir, Prince William and Catherine, albeit standing as far apart from each other as humanly possible. Let's not forget, this is still Elizabeth's show, and she's going down as gracefully as ever. Despite her jewelry collection worth millions, she's being buried with only two modest possessions. We can only hope that one of them is her prized gold-plated Nintendo Wii. And finally, we must give a mention to the man of the hour, newly promoted to series lead, King Charles III, who, in a potentially twisted foreshadowing of his reign, struggled to work out how to use a pen during his own signing ceremony. Maybe Abby Chatfield was onto something. But despite the pomp and pageantry, the showbiz and the rituals designed to shore up interest and support in what has to be an archaic system of power, the best thing to come out of all this is that the BBC aired both Paddington films over the weekend. Yay! And remember, you can't spell funeral without fun. Hooray. All right, now let's take a sneak peek into what's coming on after the struggle tonight. Coming up on the project, I'm joined by leader of the Victorian Liberals, Matt Guy. Great name, by the way. Guy, real manly with that contemporary twist. Guy and I pay our respects to British monarchs, past, present, and fictional. Take a look. In all those times, in all those monarchs from figures well known, King Arthur, Henry VIII and so on, the longest reigning of them all was Queen Elizabeth II. Thank you, Guy. Not only for clearly using Wikipedia to bone up on royalty, but for having the bravery to give a shout out to Henry VIII. Men should be allowed to murder two of their wives and divorce two more, especially if their faces aren't as pleasing in person as they are on Tinder. Absolutely. Few men these days could get married six times, though I'm sure Rupert Murdoch will try. Back to you, Ren. Ugh. Well, with that guy referencing King Arthur, we would hate for any fellow fictional monarchs to feel as though they've been neglected by the Victorian Liberal leader. So we'd like to take the time to acknowledge the outstanding regal service of some other hugely influential sovereigns. From Simba, King of the Pridelands, to Elsa, Queen of Arendelle, and of course, His Majesty, King Kong. Until next week, the struggle, it's real. Oh, hi, Marg. Oh, yeah. <laughs>